Okay, Matt Kradich, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's not really a show yet, but it's going to be pretty soon, so we'll get it up and going. You look official with those headphones. Yeah, well, I guess that's the way to do it. You know, they, they tell you you've got to have this and you've got to have that for a certain podcast. So this is what we do. Love it. Yeah, man. So you're in the thick of the season, hey, coming into the SEC championships right now. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's really just the, the start of the season in some ways. Everything else is just a, is a prelude and this is what it's all about. Yeah. How far out are we now? A couple of weeks? We'll be swimming SECs in two weeks. I guess today is Wednesday. It starts uh, two weeks from yesterday. Wow. Now, is it fair to say that you guys are one of the favorites to win on the women's side? I think so, yeah. I mean, I think the prognosticators say that we, we're certainly, one, as you said, one of the favorite teams. Would this be the first time in history if you guys were to come away with the title? Yep, we've never, our women have never won an SEC championship. So, wow. Yeah, it's wow. exciting. And our women definitely know that and are, I think, uh, pre I mean, they're really focused and really determined to do everything they can to win it. So what's the difference? You've had some great teams. You've had some great uh, individuals. What's the difference this year? I think the difference this year is, is depth. Um, as you know, the, you, you can have some great headliners, and, I, and we certainly have had – I think we've, we have a history of having really good relays. That just takes four people. Um, we have a history of having a number of people win events, but I think championships are won in, you know, the sixth through 16th spots. Mm. And, and that's in each event, but also – you know, your sixth fastest person through your theoretical, you know, in our case, 22nd best person, swimmer or diver, um, those people, if they're each scoring, you know, 20 to, to 30 points total, then that's a recipe for a, a conference championship team. We haven't had that depth in the past, and we're leaving home – this year we're leaving home people who have put up times that would score at secs and we, we've never had that kind of depth before so what is that from do you think is it a mindset is it better recruiting is it uh in your opinion where's that coming from well i think it's a combination of a number of things we we I mean, there, there's certainly the developmental aspect um we have people who you know, we're not recruited to come here, but walked on who are now in position, really good position to score at SECs and who have scored at SECs. So there, there's, I think there's a developmental aspect to it. Um, we've also we've got a really strong junior class. There, I think, I think everybody in our junior class has made our conference team and it's nine women. Uh, and that whole class, there weren't really any superstars in that, from a recruiting standpoint in that group, but they're all really solid kind of, you know, across the board. Um, and they've developed well. And when you have those kinds of numbers who are starting off, you know, just a little maybe with some conference scoring times or a little bit outside of it, they've really risen together. Uh, they've, they're a really tight class and they pushed each other and, and challenge each other to just live better lives and be be better teammates. Uh, and it's been fun to watch them rise together. They're, our senior class has got a few real headliners, but our junior class is where a lot of the heart and the depth of the team is. Um, so I think we did a good job recruiting certainly that year. Uh, mm -hmm. And our sophomore class isn't much different. They're smaller, but again, no, no real, you know, um, I guess headline recruits, but it's a group of people that have developed really well and, and helped each other get better. Mm. What are some of the tangible ways that these girls are holding each other accountable, you know, maybe from the start of the season all the way to now? We, summers are really important for us. So I think in a couple cases, the last couple summers, 
the freshmen have come out of the dorms and out of uh, cafeteria eating and cook for themselves. Mm. And that's a, a, that's a big, big difference when you have, when you go from having all this food prepared for you and you can just get to pick what you want to actually having to make the decisions way further back up the chain, for, you know, starting with how much you want to spend on food and what you want to buy and then how are you going to prepare it and, and how much effort you're going to put into planning and preparing. And the, our current juniors and our current sophomores, a bunch of them live together in the summer after their freshman year and, and really, uh, I think, created a, a little mini culture inside that group of, of eating well. I mean, eating for performance. And so that, I think that's a, that's paid a lot of dividends for them and we've been healthier because of it. I think we've been, um, we, we've been better on the road. Uh, I think we recover better. So the, the nutritional challenges of, of college are, I think that's part of the game. It's part of the competition. I feel like they've really helped each other in that area. Um, I think that, over time, our team has, I mean, this is a, it sounds like a small thing, but it's really big. 15 years ago when I got here, we had a pretty long list of team rules. And every year, I feel like I've paired those back. And it's, it's now a pretty small number of rules. And there are a few that are just absolute, like, no drinking when we have recruits, no drinking uh, certainly when we travel. And, and those, those are, you can't violate those without some pretty big consequences. Mm. But the rest of it is, is more like, we're gonna protect the team. We, uh, we, we're gonna make every effort to, to connect with each other, connect with our alumni, the people who help our team. So they're, they're more broad statements of what we aim to do, aspirations, values, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I think because of that, instead of having them feel like they're, they're avoiding stuff, they, it slowly turned into something really cool to be a great lady of all for our women mm. and to be a great man for our, our, our men's team to be a man of integrity to be I mean the the idea of a lady of all athlete really goes way back to the 70s when Pat Summit first got here um, and it's something that's been talked about a lot but I think it's becoming more and more on our team it's become more and more cool to just live a live a great lifestyle rather than don't live a bad lifestyle you know yeah. what I mean for sure. Yeah. I, I sometimes experienced in the college scene and maybe it was, I felt like it was across the America, right? I felt like there was this, there was this shield of protection when it came to um, kids coming into college and being protected by the culture itself when it came to making mistakes sometimes and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but this was the impression I got that from the age of 18 to 22, it was almost like this fallback excuse every anytime something happened that, well, I'm just a kid, you know, I'm just in college. I'm just, it was, it was almost like this automatic response to let me be a kid. Let me experience, let me do some dumb things. Let me learn, let me grow. And, and, and it just seemed like there was always a built in, excuse when it came to excellence am i wrong in that or do you get that sense sometimes i think that message you're not wrong i think that message is delivered by the the culture constantly and in some ways it's i think it's helpful to think about the the team the team has got to create a culture that insulates themselves and insulates each other from the culture at large Mm. like on a college campus i mean the stories you hear of just people doing dumb stuff is 
almost always followed by what you said, that they're just kids. This is the time to do it. And a lot of times that, you know, that comes from people who were in college 10 years ago, 20 years ago, could be their parents, it could be their parents' friends. And there's almost, uh, you know, an implied expectation that, that your college is the time to, to make stupid mistakes and then not really be responsible for it because, hey, you know, you're young and you're in college. Yeah. I think, I mean, excellence is extraordinary. That there's, it's not every day. You don't see people rising above that culture um, in a spectacular way with public results every day. Mm. Excellence is abnormal. So, and, and, you know, one of the first things that I think we as coaches tell these athletes when they get on campus, is we're, we're not asking you to be normal. We're asking you to be very abnormal. At the highest levels of performance in anything, you see a, a huge degree of abnormality, which is, you know, it's almost the definition of, of excellent. It's somebody who rises above the average. Yeah. And so w- what we are doing, you, I think you have to set the table that what we're doing is extraordinary. Uh, so the things that, that keep people average or keep people ordinary are the things that we're going to have to uh, battle against, you know, and protect each other, protect the team against, protect it against excuses and protect it against the culture at large, which essentially wants to bring everybody down to the, down to the average. Yeah. Um, and, and I think when they tune into that, when, when that dynamic is, is kind of, uh, is imagined for them and, and for the team, then it becomes inspiring. Okay. So let's embrace being abnormal. Let's embrace being just different. And, and, and then it's different to take responsibility for your mistakes. Um, I, I'm, I'm really proud of our, our seniors on, on this team because I think they embody uh, a complete sense of ownership and responsibility. And it's, it, it has not come easily to all of them. I think mm. many, many people, all of us are probably programmed on some level to make excuses for ourselves. Mm. Um, you know, on one hand, I think people are, and, and 18 to 22 year olds are really hard on themselves. And, but within that, it, there's also, a, a, I mean, sometimes the excuse is, well, I'm just not good enough. Like I, I, I can't do that. That's both an excuse and selling yourself short. And one of our jobs as coaches and the jobs of teammates as leaders is to remind people what they're capable of. And sometimes that's uncomfortable, but, it's, it should always ultimately be inspiring. Mm. How do you go about identifying that intangible? I mean, it's pretty easy when you see a swimmer in high school, wow, that kid's got talent, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be good at a, at a different level, but how do you identify the intangible for somebody that wants to walk onto your team that, that you think they're going to be a positive influence? I mean, and even the talented kids, how, how do you identify like this kid is going to, maximize their talent and be a better teammate and make us better? What, what are the things you look for? Well, we definitely look for the, the recommendation of the coach along those characteristics, like what kind of teammate are they? And then when we see them at a meet or in a practice, uh, it's, it's always instructive to watch the way that they deal with their coach, their teammates, and sometimes their parents. And, you know, there are some people and you can just see it. They bring visible energy to everybody around them. Like we have a, a young man on our team from South Africa named Michael Hooley, who I don't care how fast he is. I want that guy on our team. He's, he's really fast, but if he weren't as, as fast, you would, you'd be able to see in 10 seconds that his energy is contagious. Mm. He's happy. He's always kind of riffing off his teammates he's he's uh he sings he dances he's 
he's this incredibly powerful, positive presence. And, you know, if you think about, so he is fast and he's fast enough to make our conference team fast enough to make our NCA team. And let's say at the conference meet, he scores uh, 50 points because of his energy. He may help the, the 17 other swimmers at the meet each score place another couple places better. And that's mm. 17 times two or three points. That's another 50 points at the conference meet just by his presence throughout the year. Mm. And you don't have to be fast in order to have that kind of impact on people. On yeah. the other hand, if, if he were a drag, if, you know, if he were somebody that, that were a, felt like a weight for other people that people were always having to look after and suck energy from people, that's an enormous drain. He's going to pull people in the opposite direction. Yeah. So we're, we're really sensitive to just the, the energy that somebody brings. Um, and it doesn't have, they don't have to be an extrovert. They don't have to be bouncing off of the, the walls in practice. But I, I think you can, you can tell if somebody's driven to improve, if they are aware of the team dynamic and view it as, a, as something to be cared for, and if they're coachable, meaning they, <laughs> I think the, the, the pursuit of getting better involves admitting I'm not good enough, right? I mean, that's a hard thing to say. Everybody can say I want to get better. But then to say, well, I want to get better because I don't like where I am. Like, I, I, I want to be better. I'm no. not good enough yet. Yeah. And that means that you've got to be open to changing the things that you may be attached to. To me, that's being coachable. And if I think somebody's coachable, they're going to be a great uh, – they're aware of the team and view the team as something to be cared for, and they're driven to get better, then – you know, that can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, but, but that kind of person is going to make people around them better. Mm, excellent. Yeah, I see you as one of those types of people. So what do you feel in yourself? What makes you a great coach? I mean, we recognize it and other people recognize it, but what do you see in yourself that you feel like I'm, I'm really good at this. I'm, I'm, I got this down, you know? Well, um, I don't have it down <laughs> and, and I'm always pursuing for me how I can get better. Cause I, I, I don't ever, you know, I don't ever wake up thinking, yeah, I, I got this. I'm, I'm, I've done a good enough job. I can just coast. I, mm. I, for some reason will still, I could spend three hours writing writing a practice, even though I, I could also show up five minutes before and, and give one. Um, but I do think that that's a, a trait of people who end up having success that if you as a coach are always looking to get better and are willing to give up some things that you that you're kind of attached to and at least examine them, then you can be, you can be open to learning new things. Um, I think you, you got to work uh, a little bit with, you, we've got to work with a couple of the athletes that have come through our program and mm. uh, like Maddie Bannock with your clinics and, and the ISL team and Joey Rileman. Yeah. And I think those two, are, those two are still swimming because they have, they know there's more to learn and they love the process of learning. When, when I get to coach people like that, then I'm guaranteed to learn something every day. It may be about um, something technical, like the way they're swimming. It might be the way that they react to a particular kind of stress. It also may be, the way that I communicate, like just interpersonally. Um, I think that the moment I, that I believe I'm good enough to cruise that like, that's, that should probably be the moment that I'm, I move on to something else. Yeah. Do you think college swimming has changed? Do you think it's shifted? I mean, what are the, 
What are the new challenges that you're facing these days? It's really changed. And the biggest is recruiting, I think. Um, having to identify people a year earlier than we did even four or five years ago has changed things. Uh, I think it's, it, there's much less confidence when you're, you're recruiting men who are just coming out of their sophomore year in high school than, than women. Um, but it, there's still a lot. I mean, we're recruiting them based on sophomore year performances and there's a lot that's going to happen in the two years before they get here. Um, I think, you know, one characteristic of people who are successful is that they're willing to put in a whole lot of time. And sometimes that is, that eats away at your, your own mental health and family life. And uh, so there, the recruiting just becomes much more of a, more of a place where you can put more time and more energy and essentially lose it and kind of fall out of balance. Yeah. Um, I love coaching. I also love recruiting. I love establishing relationships with young men and women and visiting other coaches pool decks. But the more time that I spend recruiting is, is at this point going to be less time that I spend coaching the people who are already here. Yeah. And, and that pull has been, difficult to resist because there are people who are just out there, you know, beating the recruiting trail relentlessly. And, you know, and, and I don't know what their coaching balance and other life balance looks like, but I know I'm, I'm either going to become, I either need to become more efficient or, or spend more time to get better at it. And if I spend more time then then I think the people who are already here are going to suffer. So that's, I think that's been a, a an issue that I've had to, to wrestle with um, as well. I think in terms of performance, you know, you, you don't see big changes in what college swimmers are doing in the long course pool, but short course swimming has really evolved. And I think there's been a, a real improvement underwater and around the walls and with applied strength and 200s have become a lot more anaerobic um maybe even 400s and 500s uh hundreds are you know in some ways like a, a 50 long course and so the i think training has evolved the speeds have evolved and and that's been fun to try to understand and pursue as well mm, yeah yeah, I watched uh, Saito uh, from Japan swim a 400 IM at the at the ISL championship, and I swear he just went all out from from the gun. Uh, yeah. It was it was a hundred fly all out, followed by a hundred back all out, followed by a hundred breast into a hundred free, all out speed. I'm like, wow. Um, if you want to break that world record, you're going to have to go from, from the start. <laughs> it was insane. I'd never seen anything like that before. And, and, and I think and there's obviously no way he can do that long course, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I guess we're going to find out this year, right? Yeah, right. I mean, I, yeah, it's just one of those things where you see it and you're like, that could never happen. And then you, and then you witness it and you're like, wow, that just happened. Like, yeah. I, I kind of feel that way about Dressel's you know, seventeen six when he when he did that, I was like, no way anyone could ever swim under eighteen seconds. And then not only did he do it, he just tore it to shreds. So, I mean, when you witness it, then you realize what we. I mean, we're just so capable of anything, really, aren't we? It's it's so it's hard true. to put limits on what we're capable of. Yeah, that's so true. Well, and and maybe that's one of the great things about shore course swimming is it. It's a, uh, it's almost like a a step into long course. Uh, so people will push the front end more and more and more in short course. And, and then maybe we see that applied to long course and all of a sudden, you know, the, the dozen or so people who can go 146 high, 147 low are going to go 144. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Do you have anyone at the moment and on your team who you feel like has a shot to make the U S Olympic team? Oh yeah. I, I would hope 
I'm not a good coach unless I say we have a number. Mm. I mean, the Olympics are, I think, the the dream at some point of everybody that's ever put on a suit. And the, the more, I think the more I do this, the more I think it's, it's within reach of a lot of people. Uh, that meet the U S Olympic trials is it's, it's a, a crazy meet and all the favorites never make the team. And there's always somebody who is just on a, a great trajectory at the right time, who, who does make the team, who is, um, you know, makes people scramble to figure out who that is. Mm. So I think it's inspiring for a lot of people and we will, we'll have a good, good sized group going to the meet. And some people have already expressed, you know, I want to make the team and others have said it would be awesome to get a second swim in Olympic trials. Mm. Um, but we, we, we have a big group that's preparing for it. Um, Right now, you know, if you look at world rankings, um, Erica Brown has a certainly has a shot. Uh, she's won some big races recently, and and has swum fast enough to to really be in the conversation in the fifty free and the hundred free, and probably the two hundred free as well. Mm. Um, Megan Small is one of our has been one of our country's best in the two hundred IM for a long time. Um, Still have Molly Hannes, who's a 2016 Olympian, training with us, and she's putting together some some great weeks and months now of training. I think she's she's on track to do something really special. Um, on the men's side, we've got Joey Rylman, who uh, I think has has improved a tremendous amount, and for various reasons, not had it come out in meets yet. Uh, so don't be surprised if you see a huge drop from him in the next couple of months. Kyle DeCourcy is the same way. He's a big, strong sprinter that's putting in some great training right now. And then we've got, you know, a, n a number of others who I think have a real shot to put themselves in the top 16 and top eight. And I think once you do that, then the race is on to win, you know, yeah. and, and get your hand on the wall. And if it's a hundred or 200 free, then, you gotta, you gotta beat two people, and if it's other events, you gotta beat, you, know, you gotta beat six. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got some contenders. It's always good to go to that meet and have people that you feel like could be in the mix, and it's exciting. It's an exciting meet anyway, but especially when you've got people that could really throw their their name into the hat, you know. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, what do you think? This we'll wrap it up because I'm very conscious of your time, and I appreciate it. Um, it's a very competitive market out there. You've got great coaches, great programs, very well funded. Uh, you know, everybody's uh, sharing information on social media. Everybody's got really nice budgets and they got great teams, you know, so what differentiates your team from everybody else? What, what's the thing where you feel like, Hey, come to Tennessee. It's hard to know without being on other people's pool decks, but you know, what we aim to do and, and pledge to do is, is pursue, um, competitive through pursue excellence through competition. So I would say competitive excellence, but really we're always competing. We, we believe that we're always competing and, and the ultimate competition is with yourself. Like, I want to be better than I was yesterday and you use other people to help you in that journey. And I think it's a really, uh, it's almost like a basic drive that we have to learn and to get better. It's a, a human need. When you do it with other people, you, you fulfill another human need, which is to feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. You're part mm -hmm. of something that's, uh, that is almost sacred. And, the the opportunity to swim in college gives you those things. It gives you the opportunity to always work on yourself 
and through competition and to be part of something really special that that should be inspiring so we can all feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves but if it's not inspiring it's not worth being part of so we we have high standards and we do try to live exceptional lives and we do try to treat each other uh, with a lot of compassion and honesty and when you do those things i think you create a culture and an environment you i think human beings need to have uh at least a few elements in their environment to really grow and thrive and that's what we aim to do you know we aim to to help help people young men and women realize what they're capable of that it, that involves a huge amount of growth and involves always involves some really dark times some really difficult times mm -hmm. and it always involves coming coming out of those times um so that that's what i feel like we're doing here and it, when we have success competitively to me it just means that we're we're doing that pretty well um yeah. and, and we have done it well it's 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 always the result of of you know weeks months and probably years of accumulated learning and, and accumulated success it's um uh, and I mean, I like to imagine that's what everybody's doing and, and we just want to do it. We just want to do it better. We want to do it better than everybody else. And when we, when we don't want to meet, we try to learn from what other teams have done. Uh, and when we do win or have, you know, some kind of success, then we will celebrate it and then look at what we can do next to, to be better. Well, I think there's going to be a lot of teams looking at what you've done this year after after it's all said and done, because I think you're on, on the path, man. You've put in a lot of hard work in, years of work, uh, sacrifice for you and your family and uh, dedication for your coaching staff and and your athletes. So I'm, I'm a big fan. I want it to happen, man. I'm excited for you. Nice. And, and I can't wait to watch the results come in, not only for the, the championships, but also for the Olympic trials. So uh, I hope it's a great year for you, man. Thanks, Brad. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your support. And uh, um, we hope to hope you have a lot of success with this podcast. I think it's a great idea. Well, it's, it's really just talking to people that I admire and, and listening to the, their perspective. And, you know, I have these conversations with people on a daily basis anyway. So it's like, why don't I just record these things and get them out there and yeah. people can hear your voice because I think it's, uh, I mean, you're so um, experienced, so intelligent and so effective at what you're doing. I think people can learn from it. And, and that's all I want to do. Just present, present your voice and get it out there. So uh, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, man. Take care. All right. You too. Thanks. Bye.